literally 30 days until the start of the first GCSE exam. And if you're in year 11, time is something that's quite precious to you at the moment. So what I wanted to do guys was to literally give you a bite-sized video of everything you need to know when it comes to Christmas Carol. If you're sitting this as part of your set text for the English literature, paper one exam okay so this video what i wanted to do was to offer literally everything you need to know when it comes to context theme and key quotes for the main characters within this novella by charles dickens so as you can see behind me basically i've created a mind map of sorts okay so it's kind of like a little bit of an elaborate mind map where i basically outline the main context points to remind remember okay so if you forget everything else when it comes to context and this is really important for ao3 literally just remember these main points and you're fine and you're covered for context of course also what you need to remember if you forget everything when it comes to themes these are the main themes to remember and of course when it comes to the main characters including scrooge bob cratchit as well as the three ghosts ghost is christmas past present and future the main quotations to memorize for all of these characters. Now guys, I actually created um, this and put this into like a, a little PDF file. So guys, if you want to download this and have this uh, a copy of this, just literally follow the link below and you can download it for free, okay? However, what I want to do guys is to literally begin by going over the definitive context you need to know for Christmas Carol, themes, as well as the main quotations that you can talk about. And then what I'm gonna do is to go through a model answer that I've prepared for the 2020 paper. So let's begin with context. These are the main four context points to be aware of when it comes to Christmas Carol. Firstly, remember that Dickens, his own father went to a debtor's prison when he was just 12 years old. And as a result of going to a debtor's prison, he had to be put to work at 12 years old. Okay. So Dickens was writing about, for example, the children ignorance and want from a place of experience. Okay. That's the first contextual factor to be aware of. Dickens actually wasn't writing about all of these kids who worked as chimney sweepers and so on. And of course in Christmas Carol, ignorance and want, he wasn't talking about it from a place of just ideas. He directly experienced what it was like to have to be put to work at a young age okay because his dad went to a debtor's prison so he had to work for a bit when he was 12 years old in order to try and provide for the family that's the first context point you need to remember and to understand hence dickens really empathized with the poor the second context point to remember is of course the 1834 new poor law it was basically a law that was passed which basically stated that if you're poor and you're unable to look after yourself, the government can help you as long as you are willing to work for free in a workhouse, which is gonna provide you accommodation. And the accommodation that workhouses tended to provide was basically the cold factory floor, okay? This obviously, this poor law was seen by Dickens as actually punishing the poor for their position, and he was very critical of it. Of course, this poor law is alluded to and referred to by Scrooge when he says that there are no prisons and there are no workhouses, okay? This is showing obviously how insensitive he was. The third context point is to remember is to do with a guy called Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus basically came up with a fairly harsh theory. What he said is overpopulation is one of the reasons why there's lots of poverty in Victorian England and you know there's just a, a problem of poverty. There's just way too many of us. And actually things like disease, pandemics and so on are actually quite good because they kill off quite a number of us and reduce of overpopulation. Now Dickens, when he read this theory, was very, very critical of it. He saw it firstly as very insensitive. It's almost like saying that the poor deserve to die because of um, there being too many of them. And of course, it also takes the pressure away from the government to do something to help the poor, okay? So Dickens, again, talks about this and alludes to this when uh, Scrooge refers to the surplus population, the better die and reduce the surplus population. It's a reference to Thomas Malthus, who Dickens was quite critical of. The fourth context point to remember, if you forget every other context point, is to do, of course, with the Industrial Revolution. Dickens is a Victorian writer. He was there at the height of the Industrial Revolution. Whilst obviously it brought lots of progress when it came to factories and so on, Dickens was also highly critical of the fact that the Industrial Revolution created an even worse social divide, okay? So the divisions between the very few factory owners who became quite rich versus the poor on whose backs the Industrial Revolution was built was something that Dickens was quite critical of. Those are the main context points. If you forget everything to do with context, if you're not sure, you know, you look at an extract and you're like, I literally do not remember everything, I've got a blank, just remember these four context points and you are good for the upcoming English literature paper one exam. Now let's talk about themes, the main themes that you need to be aware of, starting with Christmas. 
Now remember, Dickens was writing for firstly a very religious audience, okay? People were quite religious at this time and he wanted to use a Christmas carol as a novella to remind them firstly of the importance of Christmas. Christmas was a time of being charitable and giving. Remember, God gave his only son, Jesus, okay, who was born on Christmas Day. But also, so not only was it a reminder to his readers that they need to be giving, of course, it's also a reminder of the importance of spending Christmas time with their family and their loved ones. That's the first theme to remember and to obviously talk about if relevant to the question. The second theme to bear in mind is, of course, the theme of redemption. Dickens didn't want to use Scrooge to just scare his readers and say, oh, look at, you know, how terrible he is, all the bad deeds he's done, he now deserves to go to hell. Actually, Dickens wanted to use this story as a really positive story in the sense that it has a positive outcome if you genuinely change. Remember, redemption is the idea of forgiveness. If you show that you're genuinely sorry, God gives you a second chance, as did the ghosts who gave Scrooge a second chance, okay? As long as rich people, factory owners, business people change their ways, the kinder to poor people, they pay the workers more fairly, actually they are capable of redemption. That's the main thing that Dickens was trying to illustrate through Christmas Carol. The third theme to remember and to be aware of is of course the theme of charity. The whole story is based on charity and the importance of giving to the poor. One of the things that Dickens wanted to do was to encourage his rich readers. Remember, at this time, the people who tended in Victorian era to have the time and, you know, the leisure to read Dickens' stuff wasn't working class people who were busy working. He was writing usually for an upper class rich reader who was somebody of leisure. Therefore, he was writing to remind them of the importance of giving charitably to the poor, of being generous, of paying them higher wages. That's the next third theme to remember. The fourth theme is of course to do with social injustice. This novel criticizes the very massive gaps in Victorian England between the few rich who were like Scrooge, who were very comfortable, but also a little bit miserly, they weren't paying the workers fairly, versus the vast majority of poor people. Now Dickens, not only did he want to criticize his rich readers and obviously rich um, businessmen and so on, but also Dickens was quite critical of the government, okay, because the government basically passed laws such as the 1834 New Poor Law as a way of protecting the rich rather than looking after the poor, okay. So of course he was also quite critical of the government in terms of helping out the rich and widening this gap, okay. Poor people were not really looked after, they weren't really helped, if anything they were just sent to prisons or workhouses whilst the rich were protected by the government. So Dickens was both trying to trigger his wealthy readers to change but also he was criticizing how the government was in its approach towards the poor. The fifth and final theme to be aware of if you forget everything else is of course the theme of family and this is most clearly illustrated through Scrooge and Fred. Okay so Fred illustrates the importance of family. Family offers you a source of support it's also a source of strength through hardships, okay? And Scrooge, unlike all the other characters who have families within this novel, such as Fred and his family, Belle and her family, as well as Bob Cratchit and his family, Scrooge is actually very isolated, okay? So also, Dickens wants to use this novel as a way to illustrate the importance of family in providing us comfort, in providing us companionship, and also solace, a place to, you know, go to in times of hardship. This is something that Scrooge neglected, and ultimately he was isolated as a result. Now, let's look at the main quotations. If you literally forget everything else with key characters. These are the main quotations to just commit to memory and remember. Let's start off with obviously the first main character, which is Scrooge. Of course, this simile, solitary as an oyster, encapsulates Scrooge as a character. It captures this essence of what Scrooge is like at the beginning of the novel. He's quite solitary, he's totally cut off, and also his greed only makes him more miserable. If anything, Dickens is trying to show that when he became more charitable, he was also around other people, people loved him, and he was less solitary. That's the first quotation to remember, and it's a simile. The second, of course, is when he says, bar humbug, okay? When he's basically saying, oh, what rubbish. Again, what we can see here is he disdains Christmas, and of course, this changes. The third quotation is, when he's directly alluding to the new poor laws, are there no prisons, dot, 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 workhouses. If you wanted to say, you know, you can add, are there no prisons, rhetorical question one, are there no workhouses? So it's two rhetorical questions. 
And of course, what this illustrates is how Scrooge at first is very, very um, uncharitable. He's very harsh towards the poor. He's quite miserly, quite greedy, and he almost sees the poor as inhuman, okay? They are, you know, good enough to be thrown into prisons and workhouses, and he doesn't see them as deserving of his charity. Of course, he changes because this is illustrated when he gradually realizes when he's taken to see Fezziwig, his old boss, and the ghost of Christmas past mocks the party that Fezziwig through for all of them and especially Scrooge as a, an apprentice and Scrooge says what do you mean you know it's a small matter what Fezziwig dad did he did such a positive thing for us and he had the power to make us happy or unhappy now Scrooge is speaking here using oxymoron opposite words and what he's basically saying is employers businessmen just like him have the power to really change the lives of their workers okay and it's up to them with what they're going to do with this power okay and of course what this novel is trying to illustrate to Dickens readers is that they need to think about this immense power that they have especially if they have employees in making their lives easier or harder the final quotation which obviously illustrates um, Scrooge firstly being offered a chance at redemption at redeeming himself okay so the ghost of Christmas um, yet to come basically gives him yet another chance so we can see he's forgiven and given a chance at redemption and of course he genuinely changes is when he says I will live in the past dot 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 present dot 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 future okay so past present and future this is rule of three here we can see that Scrooge has completely transformed he's changed and how he has changed is what Dickens wishes his wealthy readers would transform into okay so those are the main quotations to remember with Scrooge as well as the um, techniques that go with them the second key character of course is Bob Cratchit. He is a symbol of the poor, okay? Now, in terms of Bob Cratchit, these are the three main quotations to remember if you forget everything to do with Bob Cratchit or other poor characters mentioned in this novella, okay? The first quotation is when we learn how he's described, right? How withdrawn he is initially when we see him in Scrooge's office. We learn the clerk's fire was so very much smaller. So now here we can see this comparative adjective smaller as well as, of course, the noun fire. What does this illustrate? What this illustrates is how miserly, how mean Scrooge was, but equally how Bob Cratchit, like most poor people, are very accustomed to being mistreated by their employers, okay? It symbolizes how lots of working class poor people in Victorian England were really accustomed, they were used to being mistreated by their, work, by their employers. The second quotation, which is related to Bob Cratchit's character, is during the Christmas meal. We can see that he's still really, really happy with the little his wife is able to cook for them. But um, the narrator Dickens still admits it was a small pudding for a large family. Now, what you want to emphasize here is the oxymoron small and large. It's illustrating how Scrooge, under pain Bob Cratchit, led him to not be able to provide very well for his family. They had such a small Christmas meal, but then on the other hand, even if they didn't have a great life, they were still very happy because they were together as a unified family. The final quotation that illustrates Bob Cratchit's character is, of course, when Tiny Tim dies and Bob Cratchit is crying out, my little, little child, which is an exclamatory sentence as well as the repetition of little. Here we can see the direct consequences, the direct impact of Scrooge's behavior on the working class poor. He has indirectly led to the death of Bob Cratchit's own son. Now, the other key character, of course, is the ghost of Christmas past. So, of course, it starts with past, present, and future, all right? So let's have a look at the ghost of Christmas past. The first quotation is how he appears, okay? He seems like a child, dot, 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 like an old man. This simile, which juxtaposes how the ghost both looks like a child and an old man, is really powerful because what this is illustrating is it's symbolizing the child aspect is symbolizing the spirit taking Scrooge back to when he was a child, okay, to remind him of his childhood and his innocence. And of course, the old man symbolizes Scrooge in his current state as an older adult who's quite bitter and also whose innocence has been robbed through his greed and his selfishness. The second quotation for Ghost of Christmas Past is when the ghost sarcastically states, um, when he's talking about Fezziwig's party, a small matter, dot, 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 to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. So, of course, the ghost is um, making fun of Fezziwig's party, saying, oh, it's not really a big deal. But, of course, Scrooge says, no, it's a massive deal. Fezziwig has the power to render us happy or unhappy. Of course, what the ghost is doing is he's transforming Scrooge, is making Scrooge realise the power he had to make Bob Cratchit's life easier. The final quotation for The Ghost of Christmas Past is when, he, when we learn, once Scrooge is starting to absorb the lesson, this is towards the end of that stave, okay? The ghost, its light was burning 
ellipsis bright and here we've got alliteration of the plosives b we can see here that the spirit is starting to see that scrooge is transforming he's starting to internalize how he should change those are the quotations for the ghost of christmas past now with the ghost of christmas present the first quotation is how he's described as a jolly giant okay jolly which is an adjective actually contrasts our expectations as readers usually when we think about ghosts we think about them as being these scary evil malevolent forces but actually this ghost is almost a little bit like santa claus okay the other quotation is of course when he presents the two children to scrooge and these children symbolize the impact of poverty on young children okay young people the future generation it robs them of their innocence and this is illustrated through this list yellow meager ragged okay yellow meager ragged scowling wolfish if you wanted to also add those extra adjectives now what this listing is emphasizing is how people like scrooge and rich readers actually caused the young children okay so the children of the people they employed to suffer their innocence was robbed they looked really unnatural okay and it was all down to people like scrooge the final quotation for ghost of christmas present is this boy's ignorance this girl is what remember ignorance is used to represent children who uh, never go and get an education right they remain ignorant they don't get an education because they don't get an education they can't get jobs and they tend to turn to crime in order to fund their lifestyles and that's why um, the ghost says beware most of this child okay because they're going to be a menace to society they're going to be a menace to people like scrooge the other of course um symbol of the girl being want want just means lack of right wanting basic necessities like clothing and not wearing rags okay a lot of these children were ragged children that's why they even went to ragged schools okay because they literally wore rags uh wanting just basic um housing and so on okay so the girl symbolizes just children who lack just the bare minimum the bare basics and the best necessities the final quotations and the final set of quotes to remember is of course to do with the ghost of christmas future he's the most sinister ghost and the first quotation relates to how he is dressed in a deep black garment the adjective black emphasizes this um sinister appearance but also it foreshadows the death of scrooge remember the color black is uh, related to coffins and death okay and of course its appearance foreshadows scrooge's eventual death when he sees his gravestone the second quotation is how the phantom pointed alliteration of p here illustrates that it's unyielding it's pointing and almost showing scrooge that your fate is set you're going to become like jacob marley however the final quotation which illustrates that the spirit decides to forgive him and give Scrooge another chance is when we learn the kind hand trembled and of course kind which is an adjective illustrates that the ghost believes Scrooge can be redeemed he can be forgiven so he forgives him and gives him another chance so as I mentioned if you literally forget everything else just remember this and you're absolutely fine when it comes to the upcoming exams and as I mentioned you can literally download all of this in the link below now what i'm now going to do is show you a model response for the 2020 exam okay so i'm going to walk you through guys um, how i answered this exam paper so let's examine what a full mark model answer looks like for the 2020 exam now remember when it comes to christmas carol you always get an extract and then you're asked to talk about elsewhere in the novella of course as you can see as i mentioned i've already pre-prepared this however this extract which is where we can see the ghost of Christmas present leaving Scrooge. Okay, this is the infamous extract where you've got the boy ignorance, the girl want. You are asked to obviously begin with this extract and discuss how Dickens presents the suffering of the poor. As you can see here, guys, what I've done is not only have I highlighted the keywords in the question, so what's going on in the extract, but of course in the novella as a whole. But when you are selecting quotations from the extract that you're presented with, try to select something from the beginning, middle and end and of course also make sure you use at least two memorized quotes from elsewhere in the novella now in terms of structuring your responses for christmas carol my suggested paragraph framework or rather the essay framework would be start off with an introduction try to aim to write at least two to three points and three peel paragraphs from the extract and then two peel paragraphs from elsewhere in the novella before you finish off with a conclusion okay and you're going to have 50 minutes uh for this part of the paper so let's have a look at the model response that i've prepared when it comes to how the suffering of the poor is presented within this part of the extract but also of course how the suffering of the poor is presented elsewhere in the entire narrative okay so as you can see i've started off with my introduction okay your introduction is really good in terms of Framing your discussion, basically you t um, showing that you have a handle of what the question is asking you and you know what you need to discuss, okay? So let's have a look at the introduction. 
Dickens effectively presents the suffering of the poor within the extract and the novella as a whole because we learn that the actions of rich business owners in Victorian England contributed to widespread poverty. I've really made it quite clear that I'm answering the question and who the culprit, the people who are on the wrong are. Indeed, the children in the extract are used to show how young people were poignant victims, sad victims, ambitious language in Victorian England and they especially suffered. Nonetheless, Scrooge illustrates how this suffering can be alleviated, it can be lifted if the rich help the poor. That's my introduction. I've summarised what I'm going to be talking about and also what the whole message of this story is. Let's look at my first paragraph and as I mentioned, I always use Peel framework, okay? Point, evidence, explanation, link. In my point, I'm answering the question directly. In my evidence, I'm quoting from the text. In my explanation, this is where I'm going to add context, theme discussions, as well as techniques that Dickens uses. And then the link, I'm simply linking it back to the question. So let's have a look. Firstly, Dickens vividly depicts the suffering of the poor when he presents two children before Scrooge. The children's appearance is horrifying and Scrooge is mortified to see the realities of suffering and poverty in Victorian England, especially on such innocent victims. That's my opening point. As you can see, I'm layering in complex ideas. The children seemed yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, and rather than being angels, they were devils. That's my evidence. Here's my explanation. Dickens uses a cinderton, which is a technique listing, to highlight how sinister and gravely ill the children appear. Moreover, the oxymorons are shocking because we often think children look like angels, yet these poor children are devils. That's the beginning of my explanation when I'm adding technique. I've used structure technique, the cinderton, but also language technique, oxymoron. But I'm not done yet in my explanation. Remember your explanation is where the bulk of your marks are. This is where you're going into lots of detail in analysis. Here's now my context point. Contextually, the sickening description would have shocked Dickens's wealthy Victorian readers. Many rich people were unaware of the suffering of the poor in Victorian England. In fact, a terrible consequence of the Industrial Revolution was many people in crowded cities were paid meagre wages, hence they had to make their children work. This therefore uh, robbed the children's innocence. Therefore, these children highlight the plight and the suffering of the poor. As we can see that from the beginning of their lives, they had to work and they never experienced a genuine childhood. Hence, like Scrooge, we as readers are taken aback. As you can see in my explanation, I've gone into the Industrial Revolution. I've gone into detail as to how these children represent the poor people's children. And we are supposed to be really, really shocked. And just like Scrooge, we're taken aback. Then I'll finish off with my link where I'm saying these children highlight the plight, the suffering of the poor. I am using ambitious language as I go through my essay. Here's my second point related to the extract. Secondly, Dickens highlights the suffering of the poor by showing how many children lacked basic necessities as they grew up in poverty. To be sure, many children of poor parents did not have basic essentials, nor did they attend school as they had to work. That's my second point. Here's my evidence. The ghost informs Scrooge that this boy is ignorance, this girl is want. That's my evidence taken from the extract. Here's my explanation. Again, the bulk of your marks are always in your explanation. Dickens powerfully employs these two simple sentences to illustrate the extensive suffering of the poor. Mentioning simple sentences, that structure. The noun want, I'm now zooming in on one word, represents children who are not well fed or well clothed and the noun ignorance points to children who did not go to school. This highlights the theme of poverty as Dickens uses the children to underpin how widespread this problem was. In fact, poverty was a vicious cycle that many people were trapped in. And this theme is used to show us the dire consequences of rich people's greed. So here I've analyzed in lots of detail the use of want and ignorance. I've really zoomed in and obviously mentioned nouns, which is also language, but equally I've tied it into the keywords in the question poverty and made it a theme discussion. Here's my link. Hence, it is abundantly clear that the poor suffered and uh, key casualties of poverty, the people that suffered from poverty, were their children who lacked basic necessities and they were not able to have a bright future due to their lack of education. That's my second point related to the extract. I'm working through the extract as I'm going along. Now here's my third Peel paragraph relating to the extract. Hopefully you can see Peel is actually a very simple framework but you can still add and layer in your points as you go along. Two lines for your point, then your evidence, then at least three lines for your explanation and two lines for your link. Here's my third point relating to the extract which shows ignorance and want. Thirdly, Dickens illustrates the dark and menacing consequences that stem from the suffering of the poor as he highlights the boy ignorance as being a specific menace to society. 
In fact, we learn that the boy will be illiterate given his lack of schooling, and this will consequently lead him to a life of crime, yet if the rich were to help him, they could avoid this disaster. By the way, remember, illiterate is somebody who doesn't know how to read or write, okay? Now I'm really zooming in and focusing in on the fact that the ghost says specifically beware this boy, right? So, you know, I talk about ignorance and want in my previous paragraph, but now I'm talking about how this kid specifically is a massive threat. He's a menace. Now here's the evidence. The, um, the ghost cautions beware this boy. And he mocks Scrooge by asking, are there no workhouses? That's my evidence. Here's my explanation. Dickens uses the alliteration of the plosive B to uh, sound to add a menacing tone to the boy. He highlights how the suffering of the poor can quickly turn into a threat as some uneducated people who were once children turn to crime to rob from the rich. That's the beginning part of my explanation, but I'm going to go into context. Contextually, Dickens wanted to show his rich readers that it was their harsh treatment of the poor that created these menacing children. The reference to the workhouse should remind them of the 1834 New Poor Law, which forced extremely poor people to live and work in workhouses. It is the inhumanity and greed of the rich that created this menace. That's my explanation. I've gone into lots of detail as to context. I've also, of course, mentioned language techniques such as alliteration. Now, here's my link. Thus, the boys used to highlight the suffering of the poor as their children were not educated. Yet we see that this suffering can become a terrifying threat to society. That's my link uh, back to the question. So what I've done, I've worked through the extract, picked something from the beginning, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling. I've also talked about this idea of the devilishness. I've also mentioned in my second paragraph this idea of ignorance and want. And then I've ended off by talking about how the boy especially is a real menace. However, I need to make sure I answer because if I only talk about the extra, I'm only going to get max 15 points, okay? I need to make sure I also discuss what's happening elsewhere in the novel as a whole. This is where you've got your two additional points from the quotes that you've memorized. So let's have a look at my elsewhere points. Additionally, elsewhere in the novella, we clearly see the suffering of the poor through the lens of the Cratchit family. Scrooge witnesses how Bob Cratchit is unable to look after Tiny Tim as his meagre wages are unable to afford his son a good hospital for his disability. Scrooge realizes the suffering of the poor is directly caused by rich, greedy people like him. That's my opening point, And I'm now talking about elsewhere in the novella. Here's my evidence. Scrooge watched as Bob held his withered little hand in his hand in his and we see that Tiny Tim was quite sick. That's my evidence. Here's my explanation. Dickens uses repetition of his coupled with alliteration to reveal how callous and cruel Scrooge was as his greed led to Tiny Tim's death. Remember, callous means unfeeling, really insensitive. In fact, we can see Tiny Tim's intense suffering was caused by the unkind and uncharitable actions of Scrooge as he underpaid his worker, meaning Bob Cratchit could not afford to help his son. That's my explanation. Now, here's my link. Therefore, we can see that the suffering of the poor in Victorian England was directly caused by their employers. Scrooge learns that his actions directly caused the death of Tiny Tim. I'm talking about suffering of the poor, constantly referring back to the keywords in the question, showing my examiner that I totally get the assignment. Now, here's my final pill paragraph from elsewhere in the novella. Finally, as the story draws to a close, we realize that Scrooge's dramatic transformation where he pays Bob Cratchit more means that poverty and suffering is man-made. Indeed, Scrooge's decision to use his wealth to help the Cratchit family is Dickens's way of telling his rich readers that if they are charitable, poverty would end. That's my, open, my final point. Here's my evidence. Scrooge happily promises to live in the past, the present, and the future. And he tells Bob Cratchit, I'll raise your salary. That's my evidence. Here's my explanation. Dickens uses the exclamatory sentence and the rule of three to highlight how Scrooge clearly understands that the suffering of the poor can be stopped if rich people simply gave more in pay and donations to the poor. The noun salary reveals that Scrooge understands the vital importance of paying his worker a fair wage. Dickens does this to inspire his rich readers to pay the workers more fairly. That's my explanation. I've gone into lots of detail. Also, I've made reference back to what uh, Dickens is trying to do. This is author aim. Now, here's my link. Consequently, it's clear that the suffering of the poor is directly caused by the rich's greed. We learn in the novella that this suffering is man-made and if the rich change, this can stop poverty. That's my link back to the question. Then I finish off 
with a conclusion showing I completely understand the question and I have mastery of what I'm talking about. So here's the conclusion. In conclusion, Dickens vividly depicts the suffering of the poor in the novella, yet he illustrates that it is a direct consequence stemming from the greed of the rich. Dickens within the extract and elsewhere in the novella shows how Scrooge, like many wealthy people, created a horrendous society because of their greed. Nevertheless, he reveals that there is hope and poverty as well as suffering can end when the rich give more to the poor. And that really sums up how to write a model response and how to synthesize all the information I've mentioned in the mind map, how you can also synthesize that, bring that all together and then answer an extract based question like this. Thank you so much for listening.